Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to this licensing committee meeting this morning. And can I remind everybody that this is now being live streamed. Um, should there be a, a failure in the IT system, we'll pause the meeting and then reconvene when the IT system is back up and running. To the agenda then, thank you very much. Could we move on to apologies and substitutions? Thank you, Jim. We have apologies from Councillor Jones and Councillor Trapp is here as substitute, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Hunt is here as substitute, and we also have apologies from Councillor Harris. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, minutes, do we have anybody have any, ob I can't speak this morning, observations on the minutes of the previous meeting, in which case I will sign those as a true record. Um, and, well, there's the 9th of March and the 19th of May, I'll sign those both as a true record. I have no chairman's announcements. Oh, oh, sorry, I've skipped one. Any declarations of interest? Thank you, Maggie. Um, so, right, on to now then agenda item number five, which is the review of the street trading fees. And over to you, Stuart. Sorry, the chairman's announcement. Oh, now or later, I'm just going to announce about the. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I do have a chair's announcement, which Stuart is going to fill you in on. Thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, sorry about that confusion. Um, it was just literally to um, make members aware of the um, committee that we were subcommittee for the licensing acts, but will be on Monday the 18th um, to determine the Willow Farm um, uh, application for a premises license for like, festivals and events. Uh, I think we're all aware of this from the amount of um, publicity that it's um, garnered. Um, at this point in time, we're not sure of the venue yet. Um, the venue will either be here or potentially at the Maltins, depending on the number of people who will be attending. And obviously we'll confirm things to those who are sitting on that in due course. And to members of the public. And to members of the <laughs> yeah. public, yeah, okay. indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Now we can move on to item gender item five, which is the review of street trading fees. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, as you say, this is um, uh, to um, determine the, a review of the street trading fees. Um, this has been an, an ongoing uh, saga, really, it seems, throughout the pandemic. He's trying to um, uh, get the street trading policy updated um, to be reflective of um, and fit for purpose. Um, so the background to this is that in March this year, um, members asked uh, officers to undertake a review of the fees being charged um, for street trading consents within the district, following a request by the National Caterers Association and a local representative body known as Off the Beaten Truck. Um, uh, NCAS, uh, National Caterers Association and Off the Beaten Truck felt that um, the fees for trading on private land where the trading is not the primary function of the premises but is connected to the primary um, premises is unfair and does not reflect the transient nature of this area of street trading. So as I say, uh, as a result of that committee meeting back in March, we, um, we've gone away and just had a look to see if there's any, any room for manoeuvre uh, on this. So by way of um, a summary on this, um, the 82 Act, the Miscellaneous Provisions uh, 1982 Act, permits the council to charge such fees as they consider reasonable for the grant or renewal of street trading um, consents, um, to determine different fees for different types of um, consent, um, and also to allow fees to be paid by instalments. And we can also, uh, if we advertise, um, charge separate fees to cover the cost of cleaning up an area that may need to be undertaken by the council as a result of the street trading activities. Um, the current um, uh, structure uh, is, is such that we have static traders, we have mobile traders, we have daily um, consents, and we also have event consents, which, um, uh, for instance, um, we're covering the event which is happening on Jubilee Gardens this coming Saturday. Um, they've got some food trucks and things down there and some music, and, and we're covering that as an event consent to give you an idea of, of how that works. Um, so. As it stands, the current structure sort of allows for a 28-day consultation um, for for all static um, uh, mobile, uh, so all static annual um, consents. Um, and this, um, if whenever those objections are received, a hearing of the subcommittee is is held. Um, now, some consultations cost more than others. Um, some applications do not require a hearing, and some do. Um, but it was not when we set these fees back in 2016, it wasn't considered um, equitable to differentiate fees based on the cost factors outside of the applicant's control. So all of these variable costs were sort of um, uh, averaged 
uh, to ensure that people paid the same, irrespective of whether their application went to a hearing or, or, or not. Um, so um, that's that's where we are now. The um, the income uh, for 20, 2021 2022 from all sources of street trading um, was shown to be approximately eleven thousand um, pounds. And table table one uh, in uh, uh, paragraph four point five shows where this sort of breaks down. So you'll see for the purposes of the stream, we've got um, static trading was eight eight thousand nine hundred eighty eight mobile trading nine hundred thirty eight daily consents were nine hundred uh, and event consents one hundred eighty which which say comes to approximately eleven thousand um, pounds. Just a sort of further interest as such with regard to the trading permits issued to traders uh, who were popping up as such on these um, private car parks and other businesses. Uh, accounted for approximately £585 of the income coming in from the daily consent figure I just gave of 900 Now, the licensing budget um, uh, it, for 2021-2022 was um, £261,000, and um, estimates suggest that about 5.8% sorry, of officer time was spent dealing with the street trading work in this period. So that would equate to an a, a approximation of, of a recovery figure of 14,353. So that's just used to show that currently the indications are that street trading is, is not quite covering the costs of, of actually running it. So, we, so we're not making a profit, which is important because we're not allowed to make a profit. Okay. Um, and um, also it, 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 they are um, fully sort of compliant um, uh, in in the way that we've gone about um, uh, setting them, etc. So we are in a you know we're in a good place. We're not a million miles away from cost recovery. And as I say, it's just really sort of um, to to show that we are doing things right at, at this point in time. Um, now some other sort of statistics are shown in Table Two of um, Paragraph Four Point Nine. Um, to give members an idea of um, you know how often we sort of end up in hearings and and um, what happens uh, as a result of those, so since 2016, there's been 36 new annual street trading applications have been received, 12 were mobile and 24 uh, fixed or static ones. Of these, six resulted in the need to hold a formal hearing, um, and these are shown in Table Two. So they were all the fixed static sites um, that, that required a hearing. And the outcome on these were things like a slight reduction in, in hours or a condition about generator usage. Um, uh, one uh, we've got there granted as applied for, um, again, with another one with a generator condition added. One was refused um, and, um, and the other two were uh, reduced hours. So um, out, out of, as I say, so out of 36 new applications, one was refused. Um, and the others had minor amendments made. Um, and officers are not aware of any complaints being received that relate to consented activity. So um, once these had gone through the process and been given their consent to trade, um, we're not aware that, that any of them have actually caused um, the nuisances that, um, that, were ex that, that members of the public expected them to. Um, so the sort of conclusion really is, as it says in 5.1, you know, setting fees is, is, is a complex process um, and it's not an exact science because the figures that we work to are always, are always changing. Um, and it's necessary to balance potential income with potential costs um, and ensuring that um, the objectives for street trading are upheld and ultimately legitimate trading can flourish because that's, that's what we want in the district. We want, you know, we want people to be economically success, successful. Um, to that end, and because we are effectively in a deficit situation currently, officers um, you know, believe that the structure and, and the fees are reasonable. Um, but we also believe that there could be uh, an option to accommodate the points raised by NCAS and off the beaten truck. So as I've pointed out, all applications currently, um, uh, will, whether they're on public or private land, will go out to a consultation and and um, and they will uh, from time to time as we've seen in table two end up in, in a hearing um the current policy uh requires that um and um, as i say it doesn't differentiate between public and private land 
And officers believe that there's an area where amendments can be made to the application process in order to reduce officer time and therefore justify reducing the fees needing to be recovered. And um, these uh, are, are detailed in paragraph 5.3 of a report. So the main objective with street trading is to prevent nuisance and uphold uh, public immunity in an area, um, essentially also keep out rogue traders, uh, etc. And, um, and what we're thinking, or our thinking behind this, is where street trading is a primary activity um, or it's being requested at a domestic premise, Office, we believe that the consultation is a necessary part of the process, as the premises is not likely to have been subject to scrutiny from any other official body or process. However, what we believe is where the applicant is requesting to trade on private land, owned or leased by them, that falls within the policy definition of a host premises. Um, so these are sort of uh, social club car parks, um, you know, the, the various um, pub car parks that we've, that we've talked about at previous hearings. Um, that's that type of premise. And that trading is importantly ancillary to that main purpose of the premise. And the trading hours requested are within the permitted hours of the main premises or an 11 p.m. curfew, whichever is latest. It's suggested that the formal public consultation could be waived as the premises is likely to be a location of existing public gathering or public movements, whether vehicular or pedestrian. And therefore, the potential for a trader to bring a higher degree of operational nuisance is, is minimal. So to tie in with that, as I say, if there are objections following a consultation, it currently goes to a subcommittee and the subcommittee costs money, um, which is then charged back into our budget. Um, and then that then filters its way down into the street trading fees um, to, to, to recover that cost. So it's suggested that um, in line, where applications are in line with those three bullet points I just read out in 5.3, that determination powers are delegated to, to officers. So by, rene by removing the need to publicly consult and by removing the need to attend a hearing of a subcommittee in such cases, the processing costs of these applications will be significantly and justifiably reduced without impacting the fees and processes for all of the other annual trading in the district where we believe the fees are actually reasonable and set at the right level. The safeguard to this proposed change is that relevant responsible authorities will still be consulted on all applications, regardless of where they are uh, and how they're defined. Um, and ultimately, if complaints are received due to poor trading practices at these locations, consents can be revoked at any time. Um, so the proposed policy, which is contained in Appendix 2 of the report, and the proposed fees in Appendix 3, assume members' approval of the suggestions contained in Paragraphs 3 and 4 of this report. So really the main difference, and this is in it's Appendix 3, and it's um, effectively page 21 of Appendix 3, if, if members want to go to that page. Should, if you're all there, it should look like that. Yeah, okay. So really the, the, the proposed change here is in the bottom left-hand corner where it says host premises, C section eight of the street trading policy. And it has the annual fee there of 192 pounds with a transfer fee of 48 pounds. So that £192 would be, the, would be the fee paid by any premises in the district wishing to register themselves as a host premises to enable the pop-up traders who will separately register with East Cambridgeshire District Council their intent to trade in our district, which subject uh, or due to the previous agreement back in March will be currently free of charge. So the independent traders who work via um, NCAS for Caterers Association or, or off the beaten truck or indeed independence if they so are, if they so wish to um, will come to a council they will register to, to show us their intent to op be operating in our district we will then add their details to our website so um, uh, uh, the 
host premises such as uh, I don't know the Red Lion or the Royal British Legion, etc., um, will be able to see who is registered, um, and um, and then they would be able to uh, go without any further bureaucracy. Um, they would be able to go there and, and trade, um, and in, and the only fee that would be payable would be this £192 fee. Now, previously, and the reason why the review was asked, obviously that fee was for £740. Um, uh, and obviously um, the bulk of that additional cost is purely but down to the costs associated with public consultation and, and the hearing costs um, averaged out across the number of applications we have. So we, we see this as a, as, as a fair way to allow proper scrutiny of um, those who are trading um, in a primary function um, against those where we have perhaps already got premise licenses for alcohol, we've got, you know, um, just other activities already um, covered by, by regulation, and, and it's an ancillary aspect to it. And it ties into the whole, I suppose, the ethos of um, the change since the pandemic of, of pubs, etc., not having their own internal kitchens and providing these services, which um, I think members have been um, supportive of in, in, in previous meetings. Um, and I believe also that the public are, are very supportive of these as well. Um, so that, that's our, our thinking behind it, how, how we believe it will work. Um, and I think it's important to, to say that I've also, I was surprised to today, um, spoken with Off the Beaten Truck um, and NCAS. Um, I've also spoken to um, a, a gentleman who was um, uh, quite, um, I think there's only one way to put it, really quite angry at how the, the fee structure was before. Um, and um, and, I, and I've spoken to all of those individuals and um, uh, I've had an email here from, from Becca, who's, a, who's the owner of Off the Beaten Truck. And it says, uh, if, if this helps at all, please let members know that Food Park and Off the Beaten Truck are fully supportive of the revised proposal uh, and we would help as much as we can in, take, in talking to the different venues to, to get this across the line. Um, and having spoken to a gentleman who, as I say, was quite angry of how it was before, um, uh, he was also very supportive and understanding of the change. Um, and one of the things which we were... Um, or has been raised in the previous meeting was the difference between ourselves and what South Cams were doing um, regarding uh, this, this particular issue. Um, and this fee of £192 um, is actually about, uh, I think South Cams version of this is £208. Now we're not allowed to benchmark and I certainly didn't benchmark, but as it turns out, ours has come out at 192 So, um, you know, that, that's where we are with it. But that's the end of my report. And obviously, I'm here to, to answer any questions. Councillor Inskin. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to explore a little bit more the definition of private land because I, I'm sort of thinking through. So obviously, if it's a pub car park, that's that's pretty clear clear cut. Um, so I'm just thinking about locations in my own ward. So um, if we have a village hall like Meeple, for example, as a village hall committee and the, the trustees who run that. That's my first one. Is that private land? Does that fall under the definition? The car park for, for that? Yeah. So currently the, the host premises um, defined in, uh, again, this is in yeah. Appendix 2 and it's 1.8 and it's defined as a privately owned piece of land forming part of another business, but not falling within the definition of a highway under 7A of the Highways Act 1980. Right. So effectively any, the idea, and hopefully that's yeah. what's been captured, is any any piece of land that attached to a primary use building, such as the village yeah. car park, um, and doesn't fall within the definition of a highway, um, would would um, would be covered by the host premises. So it is our intention with that definition to cover village halls, leisure centre car parks, um, pub car parks, social club car parks, all these sort of private sort of land really um as opposed to publicly owned land uh, which would generally be lay buys and things like that yeah, I, I guess well because well, i'll come to my other scenarios so so if i move to witcham there's a car park for the village hall but actually there's a part unless you know there's a non-obvious boundary let's say between what the parish council owns and what the village hall owns yeah so would it have to be on the let's say the village hall part of the land or could it 
does it matter if because it, if you look at it, it you can't really differentiate it i, th I think on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. it would be quite it would come down to the merits of the, of the individual yeah. sort of case my my gut feeling from what you just said there yeah. is that because it's it's a it's a piece it's, it's a piece of land either car park that is used by that primary business yeah. then we would not sort of separate that off and say that public land we would class that as being a privately owned piece right. of land okay. uh, and associated and they would be able to uh, apply to be a host premises for that for that location right and my last scenario then is the uh the brooklyn's car park in sutton where it's all the freehold is all the parish council part of it is leased to the royal british legion club so is would all of the could all of the car park in that scenario be treated as full under this private land definition or would it just be the bit that's leased to the british legion club my view is on that it would all be classed as private land um but um regarding sort of uh, who potentially applies for the uh, yeah. host premises license or consent um, would either be the Royal British Legion or, or, yeah. or, or the parish council. And we have been approached by um, uh, parish councils who have you know, looked yeah. at this new proposal um, and, are, and are awaiting the outcome from this. Um, so we would talk to them about it and say, right, okay, what is it you want to do? Do you want to be responsible for this or do you want the Royal British Legion to kind of yeah. be responsible? Because who, who, who's going to be getting the, if, if indeed there is a fee being levied to the traders to trade from that location you know the kickback to cover electricity etc yeah. who is benefiting from that so if that is the royal british legion then we would argue that host premise should really be issued to the to, uh, to the royal british legion uh, if it's the parish council that are going to benefit from the activities occurring at that location then it would be the parish council applying for the host premises but in answer to the overall thing would it sit within the definition of a host premise yes it would okay uh, that's all i wanted to ask okay um councillor ambrosio um, my query really is um, similar to Mark's. Um, in Littleport, the village hall is owned by the parish council. There is an area to the rear, which is a utility um, area, in which um, is used by people using the village hall. If the village hall is hired by a third party to, shall we say, hold a quiz night where they sell tickets, which includes perhaps a fish and chip supper, and they engage the services of a um, fish and chip frying contraption in the back, hmm. in the utility area, that is only just for supplying the food um, for this event and won't sell to people walking up and saying you know oh, can i have some yeah how does that fit in with this we we would we would to be honest not consider that to be um street trading requiring a permit in that way um the idea of these is where you know some there's, there's a tied agreement usually between you know the pub and 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 the um, and the operator. And normally, it's a case that you know the pub will benefit because some of their customers will obviously buy from it, but also people will just pull, pull up, park the car up, grab a burger, jump back in the car, and go home. So, it, so there's that sort of aspect of things. In the scenario that you just said, where essentially it is a private function, um, and um, the only way they can cater for that many people is by having essentially like an external kitchen brought on site. Then, then we wouldn't look to that to be street trading. We would just see that as an extension of, of the premises kitchen for that private event. But as you say, the, the crux it would come down to, if I could then walk up, and even though they're there for that private event, but I walk up and say, oh, I'm hungry, new fish and chips look fantastic. If they served me, then in that scenario, that would be something where either the host premises consent would be required or a daily permit could be obtained for, for that um, instead, which is still 15 pounds. Thank you, that's very clear. Yes, um, you're saying though that a, a parish council owns a building and it's got a car park, the parish council would, ha would um, uh, pay this fee. Supposing the parish council owns two car parks and uh, you know you might use either, would they have to pay two fees? It, it would it would be site based. It's a site based fee. Yes. Uh, so in answer to that, yes, it would be a, a per site fee. Council Trap. 
Sorry, I must have got it wrong then. I mean, there's two questions I have. I thought it was the trader who was getting the license and the premise is not the premises. No, on this particular thing, it will be the premises will become a host premises. The trader will register with us, which is free of charge. Yes. Um, so we know they're operating in our district. But for, on this side, um, in order to take advantage of this £192 fee, the, the primary premises um, would be the host premises and they would apply and they would pay the £192 to allow them to be there. Now, whether they come to an arrangement between themselves and the people they're allowing onto their land to trade, that's between them. Um, this will not change the ability for an independent trader to apply for their own, but they wouldn't be eligible for um, the, uh, the lower rate uh, and the change the, the different system. They would effectively be treated as if they were um, trading anywhere. Um, so there'll be a daily rate. This isn't just an annual fee, and the daily rate will be applicable in difference if it's just a one-off. Right. So, so if it, if if somebody because we've had inquiries from people saying, well, we probably do this, um, you know, 12, 12 times a year. So obviously, what we said to them is, well, you can a site under the policy can have sixteen of these daily permits uh, a year. Now, obviously, if they, if you're doing it only once a month, uh, then then. 12, 12 times that figure of 15 is 180 pounds. So it would be 12 pound cheaper to apply for daily permits than it would to have the host premises. As soon as you have more than once a month, then clearly it's beneficial to go through the process and get the host premises for a fixed 192 pounds, which allows them to have, you know, like some of our venues where they have um, vans there two or three times a week, uh, certainly a lot more than 12 times in a year. And there's just one other small point. Um, Last paragraph of 5.3, um, location of public movements. Surely that might be actually um, restricting movement if one has some kind of, um, the location is a public movement place. That would be a question. might be a restriction. It was not the I think, I think, sorry, I think, I think, um, Councillor, you may have misunderstood that part. Um, what, I was, what I was trying to put in that paragraph was saying that, it, by, as, as an example of how we could um, legitimately um, uh, look to remove the need to full public consult, um, is because the locations we're looking to give these host premise consents to are a place that is likely to be uh, a place of public gathering, um, whether vehicular or pedestrian. It's not a restriction. Um, it's just trying to sort of put across to members to, um, that, you know, we're not talking about um, like we've had when on a previous application where it was somebody's home, they were wishing to trade from the, the driveway of their house, um, which is clearly going to be a different proposal to somebody who's, who's already gone through a licensing act application for entertainment and alcohol at, at, a, at a social club, for instance. That's what I was trying to put across in that paragraph. Any other, <clears throat> sorry, any other questions from any other members? I have a question, Stuart. Um, if any of the relevant responsible authorities that will be consulted anyway were to raise any objection, would it then come to a subcommittee? The, the intention is, is still um, not. It's not to say that it couldn't. The policy would allow it to, a bit like we do with other uh, types of applications that we receive. Generally speaking, um, Members of the public will um, oppose applications um, based on a degree of, of um, fear or anxiety. Um, and and um, it's not always the case, but as I say, you know, it, it certainly is, is a thing we come across quite a lot. Um, and what we tend to find with responsible authorities is they come across and, and generally oppose things because of a legal issue or a factual issue. So it may be that highways, who would be um, one of the consultees, you know, would come back saying um, there's a problem here because there's there's parking restrictions or something. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, planning may come back and say, well, there's no planning permission at this location for, for what they're doing, if, you know, to please give them a, a, the heads up that they require planning. The police may come back with with um, you know, issues that have you know they have information that there's crime potentially in this area. So so that what we would look at is if they came back with factual or legal based uh, objection or, or, or obstacles to the granting, then the likelihood is that under delegated powers, officers would just refuse. Or 
what we can do, just the same as members have done historically, and it was pointed out in table two, is we could change the hours, yeah. add conditions, and do that at a delegated level based on the response from responsible authority. Um, and if there was any doubt that um, with, with the legitimacy of, of what we were doing, then we could result to putting it to a committee, but we would rather not because obviously then we're getting 192 yeah. pounds and paying out a lot of money to come to a committee. Yeah. And I think on those things, I think that, you know, that there is that safeguard there. And as I say, the secondary safeguard and the overriding one is with, with street trading consents, we can revoke them at any time if they do not do what they're supposed to do or they cause an unnecessary nuisance. Thank you, Stuart. So no further questions. Shall we, oh, Councillor Hunt. Am I right in assuming that your real uh, aim here is to just re reduce the amount of bureaucracy and simplify things? Um, indeed, Councillor. <laughs> it, it, it is very much the case. You know, we, unless we do, we can't offer a lower rate. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, you know, bureaucracy costs, unfortunately. Um, and as we're already um, losing money on, on what we're doing, okay, not substantial amounts now, it's certainly a lot less than it used to be. Um, the only way of doing it is to cut that paperwork. And, and that's the idea here. So it's on one hand, it's to cut the bureaucracy. But on the other side, it's to enable something that is not really catered for which is what as I said right at the beginning of my report where I said we feel like we've been on this quite a journey with street trading through the pandemic mm. when when this first because I think this is probably the third third time I yeah, think we've been geez. we've been back to, to discuss this and amend it um and so the idea is yes make it as simple as possible make it as as um, cost recovery as possible and promote trade um, and help those out in the districts you know who let's face it if they can get a van to go into a village which saves 20 people having to drive into Ely, um, especially when petrol and diesel and other things we're well aware of is the state it is. And that's a yes, good so thing. I, I thought there was a sort of golden thread of common sense coming through this. And I, <laughs> and, and, and I, did, and I just wanted you to confirm that that, that was <laughs> the case. It, indeed it is, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, um, everybody. Right, okay, shall we now move to the debate then? Um, anybody want to start? Well, I'm quite happy to kick off in that case then, because I have to say, I sat in a subcommittee last month for in exactly this situation in a in a car park of a pub, um, who was already who used to serve food, who no longer served food. These people were providing a service, you know, and it took up two hours, officer time, our time, the, the applicant's time, you know, and it was clear that, that, that there was no it, it was this was just something we were going they were going through for the going through the motions if you like so I personally think this is a really sensible idea it's a very good compromise it's reduced the fees to the host premises it means as Stuart so rightly says that these places can now pop up in villages that don't have that service um, so it stops people having to, having to use their cars it provides a fantastic service throughout the, the district I'm more than happy to propose it, and I think we should take it in its entirety. Do I have a second? Oh, oh a arms second. going up everywhere. It's so. a second, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say on it. I, I just think, Councillor, in Skip's questions and also the answers he received were, were very helpful because I could, I'm very familiar with the, the, the sort of premises in Sutton he was talking about, and I can just see that that's now become simpler if they want to do something there. And I guess mm. most of the parish parish halls and things are much the same. Yeah. So it's a good thing we had this discussion. Thank you very much, Councillor Hunt. Councillor Allen, Councillor Sharp. Oh, sorry, who was first? Councillor Inskip. Yeah, just, just being brief, I think, you know, the the, the anthem, or the, let's say the, the expansion of, the, sort of these food trucks over the last few years, mm. I think has been, been a really positive thing. Um, it's you know it provides a, a really useful service, particularly in, in more rural areas, um, and it's you know it's, it's allows people to create new businesses as well. So uh, I know we've we're, we're, we've been through several iterations of this policy now, uh, but I think we're hopefully we're getting there, and we've got to something now that will um, that, that that does you know, cover our costs, but also is is a is a light enough weight process that um, I think still will allow us to deal with issues where there are problems, but hopefully will encourage uh, the take up of the, of, of the sort of food trucks and, and host premises you know, across the district. So 
hoping we can <coughs> we can we can agree i certainly support what's being proposed today uh, and then i certainly in my case i'll look to promote that to um to potential host um premises in in, in my ward because i can i can see that's going to be ben beneficial to to all of the villages thank you councillor inskip councillor sharp thank you chair um yes i think this is good because it's we're moving to what the market is currently at you know this is the trend certainly the pandemic obviously brought it on so i think we're reacting to, to and, and and adjusting to that and I, I like councillor huffer i sat on that subcommittee last month and yes it um obviously that it stops the need for that but but equally there the other side from a if, if we do have issues with a particular site there are Mm. the checks and balances you know through through Stuart to, to actually um bring that to, to the relevant committee or whatever to, to actually look at the issues that are that, that are faced so mm. I think it's, it's positive that we're, we're doing this thank you Councillor Sharp do I have any other people who would like to speak in which case then I will go to the vote um, I'm proposing that we accept the officer's recommendations in, hang on, get me find my glasses, in 2.1, little one and little two. I'll take them both together. Do I have a show of hands for approval? Any against or abstentions? That's unanimous. In which case then we will now move on to agenda item six, which is, um, the licensing officers update. I've just thrown the curve for this. <laughs> Update, please, Stuart. Um, as, as I mentioned in, um, with the chairman's announcements, um, you know, we continue to get applications. Currently, um, a lot of our officer time is being, is being taken up dealing with um, an application that has uh, received an unprecedented number of uh, objections. I think we are currently around 220. Um, we have only printed half of the report so far, um, and it's already approaching a ream of paper. Um, so we're looking to condense that somewhat before the official report papers are published for members. Um, but you can imagine that's taken up a lot of our time. Um, there are a few things which um, sort of potentially uh, are things to note. They're not something that uh, is, is imminent, um, but... Um, the, um, the government and in the Queen's speech announced um, a levelling up bill um, and um, part of that um, uh, are dis has, they factored in um, uh, measures to enable at some point in the future uh, taxi licensing to, um, to be investigated as to whether it should go to upper tier um, councils. Um, now, upper tiers um, where where a combined authority exists would be considered to be the combined authority where the um, combined authority doesn't exist it would be considered to be the county council um, so um, as i say it's something to be mindful of uh, i will bring information to members if that starts to get um, some movement obviously it'll be subject to consultations um, and and the bill's got to become an act in the first place as well and obviously there'll be a lot of changes potentially there um, but um, the, the training uh, conference I went on uh, the other day, there was a, um, uh, a solicitor there who's um, well respected in licensing and, and his words of advice were to not bury your head in the sand over it and to, um, and to sort of, uh, you know, sort of get, get ready for, um, you know, a degree of work because if it does come to pass, um, as we know, these things, um, you know, can, can happen quite quickly. Um, and due processes sometimes lag a bit behind that. So as it's just really to give members a heads up, um, but that would, that would substantially change the way licensing works in this authority. Um, because as I've said to those of you who have been at the um, fares re uh, fees reviews, um, we, we um, currently spend about 44% of our time uh, dealing with taxi licensing. Um, so obviously if that was to um, be moved to a centralized 
um, county-wide function um, to, to, to fit in with the, uh, with, um, the transport policies um, there, then clearly um, uh, there will be a difference in the staffing levels and locations and all those sorts of things as well. So that, that really was sort of one of, the, one of the main things. And there are a few changes to some animal welfare um, legislation, but they're to do mainly with primate um, uh, primate handling and um, and um, a zoo uh, the zoo standards has been uh, is has just come out of consultation is and is um, again we do have one zoo but it's not a, a massive impact but these are all things which are happening in the background um, when anything of any major relevance um, obviously you sort of get some momentum then I'll bring that to um, you know as proper uh, report item you know um, into future meetings. Um, as far as um, the taxi trade itself, uh, things are looking as if they are recovering um, from the pandemic. Um, but we have um, been um, we have received a request to review the taxi fares for the district, um, and um, I'm currently working on on that. Um, you know, and, and it, it's no real surprise that the um, the driving factor behind that is the um, cost of living increase and, and the fuel costs. Um, so that will that has a due process it has to go through, um, and that will need to come to um, to a committee um, uh, more than likely July is because of the uh, because of the sort of need to get that confirmed um, in the eyes of the trade. So. Um, there is uh, still, unfortunately, I haven't had the time to do the full CCTV consultation, but that will come, and I think that will be pushed back to September now, now um, because of all these other commitments which have taken priority uh, over it. Um, but yeah, so, so it's really, you know, there's no real major facts and figures, I'm afraid, in this oral report, um, but it's just to say there's a lot of things happening in the background. It never stands still, um, and like I say signs are that, that things are... are um, sort of improving really with, uh, it might seem strange with, with what we hear about in the news, but there seems some brave individuals out there who are applying for things to get, you know, to get events up and running and all these sorts of things. So, um, and and um, I think so before we, we had over, over 70 applications purely to do with a Jubilee, um, which has been a bit of a catalyst to, to get people back into that mindset. So um, that, that's really all I have to say at this point in time. Like I say, any further information will come to future meetings. Thank you, Stuart. Do we have any questions for Stuart after his review? Councillor Hunt. I wondered if you could just, when, when you are considering taxi fares, can you sit, uh, consider something which I came across the other day and found it quite surprising? Network Rail or the railway was charging a reduced fee on a bank holiday, encouraging people to use public transport. And the taxi fares were, were, were gladly promoting the fact they were considerably more expensive. Uh, and it just seemed to be a little bit of well, what was going on here. You'd have thought they would have been si singing off the same hymn sheet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. If you're subbing, you'll be able to maybe put your two penneth in in July. <laughs> I, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear that. Sorry, if you are happen to be a sub in July, you could then bring that forward. Well, I don't want to volunteer to be a sub. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Hunt. So now we, know, we do move now on to the forward agenda um, and we will be moving the CCTV in taxes to September and bringing forward the fares review um, for the 27th of July. Any other comments from anybody? Oh, Just Councillor one Sharp. Comment. It shows I've read it. it is the, the times on the meetings are 9.30. Oh, Zoom, yes. Yes, they are. Well Zoom done. Yeah, 10 o'clock, are we? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well done, okay. Alan. Yeah. In which case then, um, at... Oh, sorry, Councillor Ambrose-Smith waving at me furiously. <laughs> sorry, I was out of your eye line um, previously. Just a comment, really. Um, Stuart was talking about the potential movement of taxi work to a higher authority. I just wonder, from a safety point of view, um, whether there is an argument for keeping it more local. So often we see distressing things in the news, murders, sexual assaults, all sorts of things. And all too often, there seems to be um, a tie up with taxes. Now, I don't want to suggest that every taxi is a potential murder or anything, but I'm just wondering if some of the uh, focus might be lost 
you know, when you move to a larger mm. thing. Although obviously CCTV and taxes would give a, go a, a give a, you know, um, much more sort of security, mm. shall I say. It's just something at the back of my mind. I, have so, to, yeah, but I, have I guess to, there's yeah. nothing we can do about that anyway, is there? Well, I, well, think we, sorry, no, sorry. I, I was going to say, I, I absolutely echo your feelings that, that we, uh, I believe that we as a, an authority run a very tight ship as far as safety and security of our, of our traveling public are concerned. And the thought of relinquishing that to a, to a, a central body where they're going to issue licenses, where they may not be as, as thorough and as careful as we are. Gives me great pause, I have to say. I would completely and utterly agree with you. Stuart, over to you. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I was just saying, just, just to um, really to say to that comment is that with, with if, if it runs exactly like other things have run there will be a full consultation come out about um, and, and impact assessments etc and what I would be expecting is that I would bring this to to committee um, for full discussion and then we we as a council would um, would submit a formal response um, to outline our concerns um, should we get to that point as I say you know I, I, I don't I didn't really raise this to sort of like in a scaremongering way, I think it was just, it's just, I think something to be mindful of. It, it may be like other things, it never comes to pass. It will, it will be seen as a good idea at the time and then it just gets lost um, in, in the ether. Um, and it may be, you know, if there's a change in, in government at the next election and things like that, it will just fall, fall by the wayside because these things will take a, quite a while to come in. So no, you're right to be concerned about things like that. You know, I, I don't see there being a watering down of the standards that have come in um, but yes, there's always the risk that um, uh, a centralised system means fewer staff out on the uh, out out doing what they do, and um, and further to travel and things like that. And the trade, those unscrupulous members of a trade, sort of looking to take advantage of that. And I think there are things we'd need to highlight in that response. Yes, this is actually to follow. I don't know if it's right, but it's to follow on from what Councillor Hunt said about singing from the same hymn sheet. Maybe when there's a reduction of fares on the railway, we might reduce or actually totally nullify the uh, car parking charges as well, just to sing from the same hymn sheet. Not within the remit of this committee. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not sure that's in our purview, John. I, mean, yeah. I think we have absolutely no control over NCP anyway. At that but that, I'm just, just saying this might be something. To yeah. Well, national car parks tend to do their own thing, I think. Yeah. Um, if nobody has anything further to say, I haven't left anybody out that wants to say anything. In which case, then at 10.46, I bring this meeting to a close. Thank you very much for your time this morning, everyone. Thank you.